Welcome everybody to the virtual colloquia at the Center for Complexity Sciences at NAM. It's our pleasure today to have uh, Professor Daniel Basset from uh, Penn State University and also the, the Santa Fe Institute. And well, <laughs> Dani has a extremely broad uh, range of interests. She is a member of um, the, the departments of bioengineering, electrical and systems engineering, physics and astronomy, neuro neurology and psychiatry uh, at the U University of Pennsylvania, and also external professor at the Santa Fe Institute. And she uses network science in many different domains. And uh, I mean, she, she is extremely prolific. She has lots of interesting research. Uh, she has received numerous awards. And uh, I mean, I could use lots of her time just uh, telling everything that she has done. So it's a, a real pleasure to, to be able to, to listen to her ideas. So please, Danny. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to share with you some of the work that we've been doing um, over the last uh, year or so. So the talk that I wanted to give you today is, I titled it The Curious Human. And um, in, in coming with, up with this, this title and kind of the work behind it, I think about how the human mind is curious. So it's curious in a couple of different ways. It's strange and remarkable and mystifying. It's eager, probing and questioning. But despite its pervasiveness and its relevance for our well-being, curiosity remains curious and far from understood. In this talk, what I hope to do is to integrate historical, philosophical, and psychological perspectives with techniques from applied mathematics and statistical physics to study individual and collective curiosity. In the former, I will evaluate how humans walk on knowledge networks of Wikipedia during unconstrained browsing. And in doing so, we will compare idiosyncratic forms of curiosity that span multiple millennia, cultures, languages, and timescales. And then in the latter part of the talk, I will consider the fruition of collective curiosity in the building of scientific knowledge as encoded in Wikipedia. Throughout, I'll take, uh, I will make a case for the position that individual and collective curiosity are both network building processes, providing a connective counterpoint to the common acquisitional account of curiosity in humans. So first, I want to ask, what is curiosity? And when I pronounce that term, several images might come to your mind. So perhaps you think of the classic board game Trivial Pursuit, which quickly takes you to the terrible trivium in the Phantom Tollbooth. Or perhaps you think of a two-year-old child asking an unending string of questions, or the beautiful sight of hands raised in the classroom. Perhaps curiosity is the love of trivia, perhaps curiosity is the asking of questions, but I think we can all think back to curious individuals that we've met in our lives who do not necessarily enjoy playing Trivial Pursuit, maybe they're curious in a different way, and I'm sure we can also all think of individuals that we've met who are curious individuals, but who do not verbalize many questions, perhaps because they are relatively shy or thoughtful, they're not at the front of the class. Perhaps when I pronounced the term curiosity, your mind went to this wonderful piece instead from Norman Rockwell, which paints an amusing picture of the faces of curiosity for social information. Or perhaps your mind went back another century to Australian artist Jane Sutherland's picturesque piece, which paints a different picture of curiosity again for social information. Or maybe you went even another hundred years back uh, to the British Museum's Tittle Tattle or the Several Branches of Gossiping, which offers a satire on women, childbed, church, the pub market, public baths, the conduit, washing places, um, the bakehouse and the alehouse. They're all shown as opportunities for whims, women to exchange gossip. And I'll say that I'm going to try to put all of these troubling gendered associations aside and ask the question again, what is curiosity and what makes a human curious? The quandary of how to define curiosity and its places or its actions is not a challenge that we newly face. Instead, it's faced, it has been faced by many before us. So for example, um, Augustine in 397 writes, curiosity is a lust to experience or find out. And then Aquinas in 1270, curiosity is the desire to know. Descartes in 1649, curiosity is a desire to understand. 
and John Locke in 1693, curiosity is an appetite after knowledge. William James in 1899 wrote, curiosity is the impulse toward better cognition. John Dewey in 19, 1933 writes, curiosity is an interest in problems provoked by the observation of things and the accumulation of material. Voss in 1983 writes that curiosity is a motivational prerequisite of exploratory behavior. George Lowenstein in 1994 writes that curiosity is a feeling of deprivation produced by information gaps. And finally, Celeste Kidd in 2015, curiosity is a drive state for information. But what is it precisely that we are desirous of or impulsive towards or interested in or deprived of or driven towards? The answers, so knowledge, information, solutions to problems, better cognition, are commonly thought of as items, which when acquired are satisfying to us. And in fact, the analogy between hunger and thirst and curiosity, as well as the analogy between food or drink and information, underscores the acquisitional nature of our common conceptualizations. Moreover, we think of curiosity as valuable to us because when we acquire the item of information, our life gets better, our uncertainty about the world is reduced, and we no longer feel deprived of information. Upon reflection, this acquisitional account of curiosity seems intuitive, yet if we press the account further, if we allow acquisitional actions of humans to kind of play out upon the theater of experience, we quickly come to realize that we are missing a key piece of the puzzle. An acquisition or a collection of informational bits does not constitute knowledge. Why do I say that? Knowledge requires something more. Knowledge requires an understanding of the relations between bits of information, relations of cause, of correlation, and of consequence, to name a few. As John Dewey writes in another section, knowledge is a perception of those connections of an object which determine its applicability in a given situation. An ideally perfect knowledge would represent such a network of interconnections that any past experience would offer a point of advantage from which to get at the problem presented in a new experience. Or you can consider the perspective of Henri Poincaré when he writes, the aim of science is not things themselves as the dogmatists in their simplicity imagine, but the relations among things. Outside these relations, there is no reality knowable. So how might we expand the current acquisitional account of curiosity to an explicitly connectional account of curiosity? And if we did so, what sorts of affordances might that connectional account offer? Well, the connectional account of curiosity casts curious humans as those that build networks. So they build by adding nodes and by adding as edges as they grow their body of knowledge. And we can use a more embodied description to say that curious minds engage in a kinesthetic practice by walking through a knowledge space and picking up relations to structure their thought architectures. The knowledge network inside each mind is therefore constantly evolving and growing in manners and directions that are idiosyncratic. We walk along links that connect bits of information, and then we stand at the void and shout across. With Walt Whitman, we think a thought of the cleft of the universe and of the future. And when we find or discover a unit of information that either fully or partially fills that void, then we have built a new bit of scaffold in our knowledge network. In this framing, we can now ask, what is curiosity's walk? Is there just one walk or is there more than one? How are curiosity's walks similar or different? Which walk do we choose? Is it different for each of us? To answer these sorts of questions, we worked with Professor Perry Zern, who's a philosopher at American University. He performed a historical philosophical examination of the use of terms for curiosity in English, French, German, and Latin over the last two millennia. The method takes a common contemporary concept, like in this case, curiosity, and traces its usage and meaning over one or several historical periods. From these data and from this evaluation, he built a taxonomy of curiosity that's based on kinesthetic signatures, and he refers to them as the busybody, the hunter, and the dancer. And I'll work through each of these in turn. 
So the first kinesthetic signature of curiosity is the busybody. A good description comes from Plutarch in his On Curiosity, where he says, and the busybody, shunning the country as something stale and uninteresting and undramatic, pushes into the bazaar and the marketplace and harbors asking, is there any news? A second example comes from Martin Heidegger in his Being in Time, where he refers to curiosity as the not staying with what is nearest or the distraction by new possibilities and the never dwelling anywhere. Interestingly, the kinesthetic signature suggests that the busybody enjoys building a knowledge of disconnected bits of information. So he's just gathering a bit here, a bit there, a bit there. This is the sort of trivia person um, that we described at the beginning. Now we can contrast the busybody with the second kinesthetic signature, which Zern refers to as the hunter. And again, from Plutarch's On Curiosity, he says, if you have to be curious, don't turn aside and follow every scent, but keep your sense of smell pure and untainted for its proper task. And from Friedrich Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, the man of curiosity is described as wishing he had a few hundred helpers and good well-trained hounds that he could drive into the history of the human soul to round up his game. And finally, from Jacques Derrida in The Animal That Therefore I Am, to be curious is to track, to sniff, to trail, and to follow some of the reasons for the so confident usage of words. The hunter is clearly curious, but in a strikingly different manner than the busybody. And interestingly, the kinesthetic signature here suggests that the hunter enjoys building a knowledge of connected informational units, tracking, sniffing, following along a line, now, we can contrast both the busybody and the hunter with the third kinesthetic signature, and that is that of the dancer. Again from Nietzsche, but now in his gay science, thinkers of the future are envisioned thus. We do not belong to those who have ideas only among books when stimulated by books. It is our habit to think outdoors, walking, leaping, climbing, dancing, preferably on lonely mountains or near the sea where even the trails become thoughtful. Our first questions about the value of a book, of a human being, or a musical composition are, can they walk even more? Can they dance? And from Michel Foucault in his The Masked Philosopher, we have, I can't help but dream of a kind of criticism that would try not to judge, but to bring an avoir, a book, a sentence, an idea to life. It would light fires, watch the grass grow, listen to the wind and catch the sea foam in the breeze and scatter it. It would multiply not judgments, but signs of existence. It would summon them, drag them from their sleep. Perhaps it would invent them sometimes all the better. I'd like a criticism of scintillating leaps of the imagination. I dream of a new age of curiosity. And interestingly, this kinesthetic signature suggests that the dancer enjoys building a knowledge of disconnected clusters of informational units and, and leaps between them. From each of these kinesthetic signatures or these walks um, in a word space, we can note that perhaps curiosity is not what we are curious about, whether trivia or otherwise. And perhaps curiosity is not what physical actions we take. Instead, curiosity is how, how we build knowledge from concepts and their relations. The busybody builds disconnected knowledge, the hunter builds orderly targeted knowledge, and the dancer complements the local order with long leaps into new conceptual spaces. So let us posit that as humans, as we move from book to book, or as scientists, as we move from paper to paper, or as citizens, as we move from web page to web page, we are building our knowledge networks. What sorts of networks do we build? And do our preferences differ between us? These questions amount to asking how we are curious, not what we are curious about, and whether we are curious differently from one another. The work that I will describe in the next few minutes was led by psychologist, Dr. David Leiden Staley, who's now a professor in the Annenberg School of Communication at Penn. David began this study by inviting 149 human participants to browse Wikipedia for 20 minutes a day for 21 days. The participants signed a consent form allowing us to install software on their laptop to track which Wikipedia pages they viewed and when. Across the entire study, a total of 16,654 pages were visited by each participant um, over five hours spanning 21 days. So it's a lot of data per person. 
To build networks from that browsing, we represented each Wikipedia page as a node inside of the network, and we represented each edge between Wikipedia pages as the cosine similarity bounded between zero and one between all possible pairs of vectors of term frequency inverse document frequencies associated with the text of each page. So intuitively that assesses the similarity in the semantic content of the page. On the right, what you are seeing um, is that we have different individuals and the kind of browsing that we can see from each of them. On the far right, what you see is an individual who browses quite distinct pages, so darker colors or lower similarity values. And an individual who browsed quite related pages is shown, um, oh, sorry, quite related pages is shown in lighter colors, um, higher similarity values. And in the middle is someone who browses kind of in between a little similarity, a little dissimilarity between the pages that they are browsing. So these are just three out of the 149. And we see a large variety across individuals in terms of the sort of similarity in the pages that they walk among. Now, with that data, we are ready to assess the network structure or the pattern of connections between the concepts. We use tools from network science, um, a scientific discipline that studies the architecture, dynamics, design, and control of complex interconnected systems. It provides a toolbox, including analysis methods and statistical metrics that can be calculated and then compared. Translating the historical philosophical taxonomy that we've just described into network phenotypes, we hypothesize that a hunter will build networks with high clustering and low path length. And conversely, we hypothesize that busybodies will build networks with high path length and low clustering. Now, just to remind you, the clustering coefficient measures the probability that a node's neighbors are also connected to each other. And it can be thought of as the proportion of connected triangles in the network versus connected triples, particularly when the network is binary. Someone whose network has high clustering would therefore visit related Wikipedia pages. And now, just a quick note on the path length. The path length measures how many links need to be traversed to get from one node to another. Someone whose network has high path length would visit fairly unrelated Wikipedia pages. So this translation of the historical philosophical taxonomy into network phenotypes allows us to operationalize the kinesthetic signatures of curiosity in the parlance of the discipline of network science. But to formalize the link to curiosity a little bit further, we make a prediction about what features of participant personality we might track with those network phenotypes. And specifically, we hypothesize that individuals who are high on what's called deprivation sensitivity have a drive to eliminate unknown as they encounter new information and recognize gaps in their knowledge. So therefore, individuals high in deprivation sensitivity would be the hunters with high clustering, while individuals low in deprivation sensitivity would be the busybodies with low clustering. So let's test those hypotheses. We tested those hypotheses in the Wikipedia browsing data and the results confirmed our hypotheses. So indeed we found that deprivation sensitivity, which is what you see along the X axis here, or the tendency to seek information that eliminates knowledge gaps is associated with the creation of relatively tight networks and a relatively greater tendency to return to previously visited concepts. So what you see here is a correlation between the deprivation sensitivity and the average clustering coefficient of the network that is built. So on the left hand side, we see the busybodies with low deprivation sensitivity and low clustering coefficient. And on the right hand side, you see the hunters with high deprivation sensitivity and high clustering coefficient of their networks. On the right hand side, what you see is again deprivation sensitivity along the x axis, but along the y axis here is the characteristic path length. We see a inverse relationship here where busybodies or those with low deprivation sensitivity have a relatively long characteristic path length, whereas the hunters having high deprivation sensitivity tend to build networks with low path length. So very simply, what we gather from this information is that individual differences in deprivation sensitivity lead to the creation of knowledge networks with really distinct architectures. So what that means is that when we seek information as individuals, as people, we all seek it differently, constructing very different networks of knowledge. But what's interesting is that 
not only do we seek information differently from one another, but we also appear to seek information differently day by day. So to show you this, I want to note that we separated the data into early, middle, and late browsing periods. And we also measured what's called sensation seeking as it varies from day to day. And what we found is that days of greater sense sensation seeking than normal are days in which participants built more as busybodies than as hunters. So from these data, we can conclude that every day we are curiously different, differently curious than any day before. And the kind of type of curiosity that we have depends of our level on our level of sensation seeking that day. So are we seeking for novel information? Are we seeking for new experiences? Or are we sort of held back a little bit and um, thinking that we'd like life to stay just the way it is? To push this a little bit farther, we built a computational model, um, which I won't be able to get into the details of today, but I did want to mention. Uh, it's a computational model of kinesthetic curiosity that generates walks on existing knowledge network architectures. And in that model, what we do is that we balance preferences to retrace the familiar steps. So go back through the same Wikipedia pages, which we actually find that people do fairly frequently, versus explore the unfamiliar. Um, and we also try to balance the preferences to take short versus long steps. And with these two parameters, the model that we build can predict the architectures of networks that are built by people with different kinesthetic signatures. What we find from the model is that deprivation sensitivity is associated with retracing the familiar, whereas subclinical levels of depression are associated with taking shorter steps in the Wikipedia knowledge network. So the links between sensation seeking, depression, and kinesthetic actions in knowledge space underscore the potential reflections of clinical factors in the way that we walk on networks. And collectively, both the data and the computational model serve to reconceptualize curiosity as an act of connecting rather than a method of acquiring information. Now, I'll note that several open questions remain that could guide future work. First, as I noted earlier, George Lowenstein argued that curiosity is a feeling of deprivation that's produced by information gaps. So we can ask, do we see evidence of these gaps forming and then filling in as the networks are built? To answer this question, we're currently using tools from applied algebraic topology, specifically persistent homology, um, guided by the work of Dr. Anne uh, Sizemore Blevins who recently published a paper during her time in the lab revealing the growth of these kinds of knowledge gaps in children as they learn language. And we think the same sorts of tools can be useful here in understanding the growth and filling in of knowledge gaps as we browse Wikipedia. Now second, compression progress theory is sort of a counterpoint to the information gap theory of curiosity. And what compression progress theory posits is that curiosity or drives this seeking of information that increases the compressibility of knowledge. So we can ask, do we see evidence of growing compressibility as the networks are built? To answer that question, we're currently using tools from information theory and StatMech guided by the work of Dr. Christopher Lin, whose paper on archive that I'm linking to right here, um, and it's currently in revision, offers a formal method to evaluate the compressibility of a network. So with that tool, we can now ask whether these networks are being built to become more compressible or whether they are being built to become less compressible, more spanning as time goes on, and whether that is a difference between individuals. So with that, I'd like to transition from the individual uh, to the collective, as I had mentioned, I was hoping to do at the beginning of the talk. So humans are definitely not only curious in the unitary, but also in the aggregate. And the fruition of collective curiosity is the network of scientific knowledge that Henri Poincaré mentioned in the passage that I had quoted earlier. We could also similarly have pointed to Lauren Oaken's Elements of Physiophilosophy, which he first published in 1810. It was then translated into English in 1847. He notes there that science is a series of necessarily interdependent and consecutive propositions. So these two scientists, Poincaré and Oaken, 
their, well, their scientists, philosophers, hybrids, I should say, um, state frankly what we intuitively appreciate, which is that we cannot truly understand any item of knowledge until we understand its relations to other items of knowledge. And deciphering those relations is really what science is about. But how do we do it? Well, in the philosophy of science, philosophers have actually described patterns of scientific development in various ways. For example, Thomas Kuhn talks about having two regimes of science. The first is normal science, in which a normal scientist simply solves puzzles within a paradigm. And then you have a paradigm shift, which is a revolution in which the model of reality undergoes some drastic change. For example, going from the geocentric to the heliocentric theory, or from Newtonian physics to relativity. And science progresses as a back and forth between these patterns, these normal science and paradigm shifts. Another philosopher, Paul Feyerabend, proposes that science progresses as a pure competition of ideas and that there's no characteristic pattern to scientific development. And then a third philosopher of science, uh, Lakatos, balanced the two ideas of Kuhn and Feyerabend by suggesting a research program, which has a core set of postulates and then an auxiliary belt of hypotheses that are built upon the core. So how would we go about testing these three ideas empirically? Well, we again turn to Wikipedia as a growing network of scientific knowledge, and we evaluate its time evolving architecture. So we begin by treating each page as a node in the network and by treating each hyperlink as an edge in the network. We estimate a date for the main concept presented in the page by examining the history section and extracting the first year in that section. And using this method, we can create very large concept networks for different subfields of science. Um, and I'll note that there's a, a GitHub link here. If you want to visualize any of these networks, all of the data is available. Feel free to go check it out. Um, and there's a visualization tool there as well. Now, note that in this particular formalization that I am describing, the concept networks that we study are not commitments or scientific practices or social practices, which is something that um, many of the uh, philosophers did discuss. Rather, they're historical networks of concepts and their relations or dependencies. The ideas of Kuhn and Feyerabend and Lakatos are partly about commitments and practices and partly about the development of new concepts. And, and what I'm going to focus on is just that latter part, just about the development of new concepts. So in Kuhn's normal science, where scientists solve puzzles within a paradigm, one could see that the new concepts connect different parts of the network together. So in network terms, we may see a relatively high clustering of nodes. Whereas in Lakatos's research program, he describes science as having a core set of postulates and then an auxiliary belt of hypotheses. So in network terms, we might see a core periphery structure in which the core is tightly connected and then the periphery is loosely connected to the core. In Fire Robin's thesis, where there's no characteristic pattern, we might see a relatively random structure. So let's go to the data and ask whether there's evidence for any of these three hypotheses. So first, we quantify the network topology using common network statistics and compare what we observe in the true data to edge rewired null models that maintain the same size of the network and the same number of edges. We measured first the clustering coefficient, and that's what you see over here, which assesses the preponderance of triangles versus connected triples. And in the data, we see that science concepts, which are in the, the data points right here, they're much more clustered than they are in random network null models. So that suggests that yes, there's high clustering consistent with perhaps what Kuhn would have imagined. Next, we measure modularity or the presence of communities where nodes within a community are more densely connected to one another than to nodes in another community. In the data, which are the data points over here, we see that science concepts have higher modularity than random network null models. So again, suggesting that there is certainly a clustering structure and even perhaps a community structure. And last, we measure the coreness, which is the presence of a densely connected set of core nodes accompanied by a sparsely connected periphery. In the data, what we see over here in these points is that science concept networks have higher coreness than a random network null model. 
And collectively, these data suggest that real networks are very structured and certainly not random, which may suggest some constraints on the process of scientific development, unlike Fire Robin's description. So let's consider the constraint that Lakatos proposed, that the periphery builds upon the core. So there's a core of postulates and then a periphery of hypotheses, and those hypotheses build on the core. In the data, what we can do is that we can measure whether core nodes are born before or after their neighboring peripheral nodes. And that's what you're seeing here. So for all of these different um, uh, fields of science, you can see the data points for whether the core was born earlier for that particular concept or whether the periphery was born earlier uh, in that particular concept. So in general, what we find is that core nodes are not born before their neighboring peripheral nodes. You can see that the majority of the data are really along the zero line here. So that suggests that there are some additional constraints beyond um, this core periphery suggestion that guide the process of scientific development. So what does that leave us? Well, Science concept networks are clustered and they are modular, not random. They have cores and peripheries, um, but they simultaneously grow both outward to the periphery and inward to fill the core. They're doing both. They're growing both out and in. So could Kuhn be right, maybe, that normal science is a process of puzzle solving or of filling knowledge gaps? Well, let's check. To study gaps or cavities in the growing network topology, we use a tool from applied algebraic topology, which is known as persistent homology. And persistent homology generalizes the notion of gaps into n dimensions and keeps track of when a gap is created and when a gap is filled. In zero dimensions, a gap can be two disconnected nodes. When a node connects those two nodes, the gap is filled or when an edge, sorry, connects those two nodes, the gap is filled. In one dimension, as you see here, a gap can look like a square and then can be filled in by a node connecting the corners. And in two dimensions, a gap can look like this, so an octahedron, and that can also be filled. Intuitively, the gaps in concept networks can be thought of as kind of um, opportunities or puzzles. And in the data, we can see here the cumulative frequency of the lifetime of gaps in real versus null model networks. So real is the dark blue line and the edge rewired null model is in peach. We also have a genetic model, which I'm not going to get into for the sake of time today. Um, note that the null model networks have the same number of nodes and for the edge rewired null, also the same number of edges. What we see is that science concept networks have shorter lifetime gaps than the null networks, and they also have fewer open gaps than the rewired null networks. So we do see evidence of normal sci science or the filling in of knowledge gaps. Real networks both fill in and create gaps, or fill in gaps faster and then create fewer gaps than the random model networks. But, but why might they do that? What's, what's, what's in it for science? Well, to answer the question of why, we can ask which contributions are most influential in science. And as one marker of influence, but certainly not a perfect marker, we consider um, Nobel Prizes. And we measure whether those Nobel Prizes tend to be given for concepts that either start a gap or close a gap or are not related to gaps at all. And first, what we find is that Nobel Prize winning nodes are more likely to participate in a simplex in which a gap is birthed than non Nobel Prize winning nodes. So let me walk you through the data here. In the dark blue is a Nobel Prize winning node, and in um, peach is a non Nobel Prize winning node. And what you can see by the difference here is that the Nobel Prize winning nodes are more likely to participate in a simplex in which a gap is filled than the non Nobel Prize winning nodes. Now what you're seeing on the right hand side is that we also find that the Nobel Prize winning nodes are more likely to participate in a simplex in which the gap is filled. So it's a death simplex rather than a birth simplex. So what these data suggest collectively, these two pictures together, suggest that influential nodes or influential concepts, influential discoveries are those that, are, that more frequently participate in either the birth or the death of cavities meaning that gaps are important. So what have we learned in this study of, of collective curiosity? Well, 
In a network formulation of scientific discovery, data-driven conditions underlying breakthroughs depend just as much on identifying uncharted gaps as on advancing solutions within scientific communities. And more specifically, the findings reveal that human knowledge grows by filling gaps in knowledge, perhaps driven by the collective curiosity of individual scientists through both an inward exploration to fill out the core and an outward exploration to fill out the periphery using very gradual modifications of the network structure. Moreover, the knowledge discovered while creating and filling knowledge gaps is likely to be more influential and uh, more frequently awarded in the scientific community than knowledge that's disco discovered away from gaps. Our mathematical formulations here um, of the historical data pave the way for uh, pave the way to better describe and understand scientific progress. And they offer a data-driven approach to identify novel contributions. All of the data and code is also available, by the way, in case anyone's interested in investigating these ideas further. So several open questions remain on this front as well. First, a big question is, do our conclusions hold if we examine non-English Wikipedia? Everything that I just showed you is using um, English Wikipedia. So to answer this question, it would seem reasonable to talk with the Wikimedia Foundation to gain a lot more understanding of the structure of Wikipedia across languages, which is something we're in the progress of doing. But a second question that's open is, you know, is there a shared principle evident in the way knowledge grows and the way we teach knowledge to others? Is there something common about how knowledge is structured and how we share knowledge with one another. To answer this question, one could use tools from natural language processing, perhaps guided by a recent study led by Nico Christensen um, during his time in the lab on the architecture of college level mathematics textbooks. So um, in this paper, he evaluates the architecture, growing architecture of concept networks in mathematics texts, which concepts are introduced first, which concepts are introduced later. He does see a clear modular structure similar to what we see in Wikipedia. He also sees a clear core and periphery structure as well, and we can evaluate the, the time evolving nature of that progression. Is that similar to the way in which science develops? The third open question is what factors allow for the architecture of knowledge to reconfigure during paradigm shifts or conceptual leaps? What is it about the organization that might allow for drastic change, not rigidity? There is a lot of rigidity in known knowledge, but there's also the possibility for change. What is it about the architecture of knowledge that allows that potential for change? And to answer this question, we are very curious about using tools from um, mechanics and dynamical systems to some degree. And I'm particularly thinking of some work by Jason Kim in the lab that was recently published on uh, designing and controlling conformational change in mechanical networks. And I think that some of these notions of the degrees of freedom in a network and the sort of conformability of the network may be helpful in our understanding of how knowledge networks may be amenable to change. So with that, I, I just am left to summarize what we've gone over in the last uh, few minutes. So we started by suggesting that individual and collective curiosity are both network building processes. And those processes can be informed by historical philosophical examination of the use of the terms for curiosity in English, French, German, and Latin over the last two millennia, as we showed. The curiosity archetypes that are evident there are also evident in the ways that humans browse Wikipedia. The curious movements are also evident in the ways that humans build scientific knowledge. And these two studies put together, I think, provide a connective counterpoint to the more common acquisitional account of curiosity in humans, but leave many questions unanswered. So it's an exciting um, place to be investigating. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the people who were important uh, in the lab, uh, the funding agencies, particularly the Center for Curiosity and the National Science Foundation um, Career Award. I would also like to recognize the individuals who led the study. So the first study was led by David Leiden Staley, who, as I said, is now a professor in the Annenberg School of Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Perry Zern, who's the philosopher at American University I mentioned. Um, collaborators Dale and Ann Blevins as well. For the second study, um, uh, 
most of these, actually, all of, almost all of these stayed on the second study, um, but we now, that second study was led by Harang Zhu, and we included as well um, Dr. Judith Kaplan, who works in the history of science at the University of Pennsylvania, and Dr. Julio Tuma, who works in the philosophy of science at the University of Pennsylvania. So both of these studies have been um, really fun forays into very interdisciplinary spaces, and I'm uh, very grateful to all of the uh, collaborators for their uh, input and guidance. So with that, thank you so much for listening. I would love to take questions. Thank you very much, Danny. It was very interesting talk. There are already several questions on the YouTube chat. So if, if you have more questions, please feel free to add them at the chat. Um, one question is, can we define a general concept of curiosity that applies for intelligent agents? For all intelligent agents? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I'm a little biased. I think that the curiosity is the building of networks. And so the question is then what kind of networks are built by human agents versus non-human agents? They may be different or the network building processes may be different. Yeah. Um, another question by Daniel Mejia, how does collective curiosity work with people from different backgrounds? That's a really great question. Um, so we think that people from different backgrounds may be providing very different networks and that then there is some agglomerating process. Um, unfortunately, what we also know about science is that there is frequently a um, dismissal of some voices and an aggrandizing of other voices. And so that agglomeration process is likely to be biased. Uh, and that's something that um, needs to be addressed, but is not addressed in this, these two studies. Yep. Another uh, question, the difference between the busy body and the hunter was number of visited nodes. Was there a measure of the depth in, that users understood each of the topics? I mean, do different curiosity lead to better understanding? Mm, yeah, that's a really good question. So um, we don't have a quantification of how well they learned the topics. That's something that would be interesting to include in future work. But I, I guess I would say that the more that we've worked with these ideas, the more I think that these three archetypes are ones that we may each have in our lives at different times. And I'll give you a, a really concrete example. So when we are engaging in a new scientific project, and we're trying to think through a new idea. I think initially, I think a lot like the busybody. I'm just kind of canvassing random, reading random papers, reading random books, going to conferences, sitting in on talks that have nothing to do with what I do, right? Um, and then I come up with an idea. And once I have the germ of an idea, I follow it a little bit more like a hunter, you know, working through how does this idea connect to this other idea? And I try to work carefully through all of those connections. And then at the end of a research project, you often, I think, do more of what the dancer does, which is to say, here's this very focused study, but it could have important implications for this and this and this, which are kind of a leap away. And that's often how you write your discussion section of a scientific paper. So I would say that that's just a simple example in my life and in my career of the kind of way that we would move through the different curiosity um, phenotypes ourselves in a single person. And Gabriel Ramos Fernandez, he posed a question that actually I was thinking about him posing this question when, when you were speaking because he, he studies um, foraging patterns in monkeys and he has found that they follow the Levi flights or Levi walks. So mm -hmm. basically lots of small uh, steps and then few large ones and then this follow up or low. So the question is, do you find it useful to see these knowledge networks as the result of different combinations exploration, exploitation, in, move, in movement terms, Brownian versus Levy walks. Yes, um, the computational model that we have does have levy, a levy flight parameter in it, um, which is tuning kind of the size of the walks and the propensity to have the short versus the, the longer flights. So we definitely see that to be quite important. We don't see anyone who's very Brownian, I would say. That's okay. pretty rare. Uh, Mario Flores Lopez asks, can curiosity be considered as an emerging property of a complex system? 
I think that collective curiosity, I think of as, as an emergent property. Um, I think it's harder for me to think about individual curiosity as emergent, but depends on how you define emergence, which is always the difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> Some properties that emerge, well, that are uh, properties of the system and not of its components. Yeah. So I think definitely for collective curiosity, that is true. Um, for the individual, it's, it's more complicated. Yeah, or, or perhaps less useful or because, I mean, you could say, well, sure, it emerges out of neuronal interactions and that doesn't yeah. tell you anything. <laughs> right, right. So how, <laughs> how does it do that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, I mean, well, of course, different people have different ways of thinking and you can also, uh, I mean, if we, we could come up with some measure of curiosity, we would find that some people are, are more curious than others and so on. Uh, but I, I understand that nowadays many people, uh, especially in, the, in different workforces are seeking creative people but it seems that our educational systems are suppressing <laughs> creativity in different ways because let's say if the methods that uh, we, we teach our kids such that um, let's say you, taking the, the, the metaphor of, of a knowledge network, you, you basically have to learn these things. But then if you stray to another topic that is not covered by the course, no, yeah. no, you're going too far. Exactly. You, you shouldn't ask this question. So, so they're basically cutting those uh, potential jumps very early on. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I was thinking while listening to, to your talk whether we could use your results to push the idea that we should promote creativity in different ways in, in the educational system. Yes, um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm actually, um, Perry and I are finishing a book. It's under contract with MIT Press. It's due at the press on May 1st. So it's, it's very soonly done. Um, and the last chapter in the book is on um, how to support curiosity in our current educational systems um, or with educational reform and what would that look like? So I completely yeah. agree with you. Um, I think that this approach has a lot to say about the sorts of curiosity that um, we could value. And I think it's it's also a counterpoint. I mean, I, I emphasized the fact that this was a connectional counterpoint to the acquisitional account, but I think that it's also a counterpoint to the linear dimension, like you are curious or you're not curious, or you're more curious than or less curious than someone else. I think what this approach allows you to say is that you're differently curious right? Yep. It's not better or worse necessarily, but it's different. And I think that emphasis on the differences and the ways in which we can be curious and how we can be diversely curious um, helps to push against the sort of reg um, regulating of curiosity or the policing of curiosity or the controlling mm -hmm. of curiosity um, in kids or, or in adults. And, well, this reminds me of Mihaly Kisa Mihaly's theory of flow where uh, basically in order to, to perform in, in an educational context, uh, I mean, different students have different abilities, but then if the challenges are beyond their abilities, they will be frustrated because they won't understand. But if they are too easy, they will be bored. So in order to engage them, the challenges have to be a bit higher than their current abilities and then they can step up. Yep. Uh, and that's actually, uh, it makes people feel good. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's absolutely so, true. I and mean, it has to do with the distance of the step size, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I guess it's different, difficult to generalize because precisely different people have different capabilities and different curiosities. So it's difficult to say, okay, it has to be this way. But with the different educational tools that are being developed, I guess we can move uh, more towards individualized learning tools. Yeah. And then let's say, individuals could learn at their own pace and according to their own curiosity. And then maybe we could promote uh, high levels of curiosity. Yeah. But yeah. The, um, and Ayatsin Mendoza asks, on this study of brain flexibility, what implications may it have with patients with uh, stroke or Alzheimer's? 
Um, that's a really good question. The studies that I described, well, the first study is the only one with, with human participants that we actually examined, and they were all uh, healthy adult individuals, so there was not a clinical population. Um, I think it would be really interesting to try to understand the degree to which kinds of curiosity may be altered in different patient populations. Um, the only piece of information we have from our current study is that subclinical measures of depression were correlated with the way that people were walking through Wikipedia. So that suggests to me that, you know, in clinical levels of depression, there would also be an effect. Um, and depression is, is often comorbid with uh, recovery after stroke and with um, other neurological and psychiatric diseases. So it could certainly be uh, affected elsewhere, but we just, we don't have any data yet. Um, that's ongoing work. Yes. Gabriel Ramos Fernandez asks, uh, do you think you could study curiosity also in the way Wikipedia pages are edited? For example, a single user could participate in many or unrelated pages <coughs> only within a certain set of related pages and so on. That's a really great question. Um, and I was just talking to the Wikimedia Foundation, I don't know, a week or two ago, and they asked the same thing is, can you determine um, what kind of curiosity someone has but based on their editing practices? I think it's a really great question and it had not occurred to me before that. So um, thanks for raising it again. I, I think it's likely that there would be a signature there. We haven't tried it, but I would be very curious to know. Who are trolls and who are I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, or can you tell the difference? The other thing uh, that has been suggested is, can you tell the difference between bots on, on Twitter versus mm. humans? Um, and there is some evidence um, from my colleague, Sandra gonzalez Balon, um, some differences in the way that, that bots kind of interact with others and are interacted with. Uh, but it's also, I'd also be interested to know whether there are curiosity signatures there too. Of artificial yeah. intelligence, basically. In, in Twitter, it's easy to find bots either whether they are software or controlled by humans, because as they try to pump up or push down some uh, trending topic, they start retweeting themselves. So basically, w when you look at the retweet network, you start having cycles. And in in honest uh, users, you just have let's say someone tweets and then. People retweet, but uh, th there's no retweeting back to yeah. something that you already retweeted or someone already retweeted you about. Interesting. Uh, Jose Luis Guardillo asks, um, I guess it's not easy to decouple the concepts of curiosity and learning. So uh, machine learning need to be given curiosity in order to become real learning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so machine learning to become, th put the last part again? Uh, well, I, I could try to rephrase the question, okay, yeah. whether what you found about curiosity could be applied for machine learning algorithms and make them better in some yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that that's, that's definitely a possibility um, is to, and, and that's also a common question that comes up is, is there a way for us to take some of these ideas and, and encourage artificial systems to explore spaces in the same way that humans are exploring. And I think that that's, that's definitely possible. It's not something that we've done in my lab, um, but I think it would be a really interesting direction to take the work. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we yeah. really enjoyed the, the presentation and the discussion. Thanks so um, in a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll have Alessandro Vespignani. Uh, so be sure to, to join us. And um, thanks again, Daniel. Great, thank you. Take care.